Okay, hello everybody and welcome back. Um, today we're going to be thinking about analog and digital conversion. So in the last video uh, we looked at uh, how we can take an analog signal, so my voice, and turn it uh, into something that can be transmitted over long distances. Well today we're going to look at how we can do that digitally. We live in a digital world um, and it's become an increasingly important technology. Um, so by the end of this video you should understand how we convert to and from analog and digital. Um, you should be able to show how an analog signal gets converted into a binary signal. Um, you should be able to handle some advantages and disadvantages of analog and digital. Um, and we might go on to this idea of aliasing um, and what that is. Um, so, a couple of images here. Um, the first thing you can see uh, is a record player. Uh, this is an electron micrograph of a record player in action. And what you can see um, is that the very early sound reproduction uh, was caused by a little needle actually moving through grooves, and the grooves corresponded to the actual compressions and refractions of the air. So this was an analog technology. Um, now, that's been replaced pretty much entirely in our day-to-day -day life now with computers, um, and they all use digital, so that you can see the CD here was the earliest really kind of commercial form of a digital signal, um, which encoded information as ones and zeros. So in the center diagram, you can see a wave. That's an analog wave. You can see that our exposition is varying in time. So our exposition could be anything. Usually, if we're thinking about sound, because it's nice and simple, um, it'll again be the position of a diaphragm um, in a microphone, which is converting to a voltage. So it gives us the compressions and refractions again. Underneath that, you can see a digital signal. Um, so this is what a, what a uh, CD would look like. So in a CD, we have pits, um, and you have a pit that goes in for a zero and lifts out for a one. So you can see a pattern of zeros and ones. And that's the essential difference between analog and digital. Analog is the real world. Analog is everything that we see around us, and it can take any value. Digital is really reserved just for computers, um, but it has the kind of advantage to us that it's either a zero or a one. There are no middle values. So why digital? There's two main reasons for using digital. Number one is that computers speak it. So it's very simple to convert into something that can be stored on a computer and processed by a computer. This video that I'm making to you today um, uses a little bit of green screen technology. It's all been digitalized. It's all been on computer. So once we're dealing with something in binary, it's easy for that to work. Um, the second reason has to do with the noise. Um, so if you look at the top image, that's an analog signal, um, and you can see that I've got some noise added to it, so it's got a bit messy and dirty looking. Now if I amplify the analog signal, I'm also going to amplify my noise. Uh, noise generally we consider to be random, so there's no easy way of getting rid of that noise from an analog signal, because I can't tell what's uh, a variation in my signal that was supposed to be there, and what variation is due to this noise. So it's really difficult to deal with. Digital, on the other hand, well, you can see when I add uh, some noise to my digital signal, I can still really easily see when it's supposed to be high and when it's supposed to be low. Um, so I can regenerate it, and that's a really easy process to do with a digital signal. Um, that's why if you're watching things like Astro and it starts to rain, you either have perfect picture quality or it cuts out entirely. It cuts out entirely when the regeneration uh, systems no longer work and it can't recover what it's supposed to look like, so you have no signal at all. Up until that point, you get perfect signal because the computer can work out what the signal is supposed to be. Um, so what's the basic process in a uh, modern world? Well, we start with analog input. So that could be a microphone, guitar, video stream, literally anything. And we do something called analog to digital conversion. So what we do is we take a digital numerical data or samples that say what the value of the analog data was at certain times. And we can, then do, we can store it, we can transmit it, we can edit it, we can do whatever we like with it, so we do that in a digital system. Um, and then we send it to digital to analog conversion. And digital to analog conversion, we take our digital signal, our bits of ones and zeros, and we turn them back into something analog. Now you looked a little bit at a uh, digital to analog converter system way back when you were doing op amps. You may remember that there was this weird circuit um, that you could have different values of resistors, which would give you different voltages going into an input, um, and that would give you different outputs from your op-amp. Um, so an op-amp is a really simple type of a digital to analog converter. Okay, so let's think about converting this analog signal into digital. The red line you can see here, that's an analog signal, and you can see it's varying over time. 
To do digital sampling, what we do is we record the value of the analog signal at a set number of times. So you can see here in the table, I've just, I've just turned this from a nice simple wave into data. And being a physicist, I like data, I can work on it. It's a lot easier to store, life is simple. However, computers don't actually understand anything we've written there. Um, so we need to understand what digital really means. Now, we use the Arabic number system, and in the Arabic number system, um, it, we, it's based around base 10. And I'm going to try and explain to you what base 10 means with some examples. Um, so number one, if you think way, way back to primary school, we have hundreds, tens, and units. So the number one is no hundreds, no tens, and one unit. Uh, the number two is no hundreds, no tens, and two in your units column. The number nine is still no hundreds, still no tens, and a nine. Now, this is the important bit. When we get to 10, we can't store the value 10 in the units column. There aren't enough units left. We only have nine of them. So the way our number system works is instead of recording a value of 10 in the units column, which wouldn't work, we say, OK, we'll take it into the next column over. So we'll have 110 and no units. So the number 10 actually means 110 and no units. Uh, the number 19 means 110 and nine units, and you should be able to see now, well, I can't store anything else in the units column now if I want to increase my value by one, so I have to increase the tens unit instead. So it becomes two zero, or 20. Now, if I want to record 59, I have a 50 in my tens, because I have 50 lots of 10, and I have one nine. Now, if I want to record 99, then I put a nine in my tens, and a nine in my units. But if I want to get to 100, Again, I've got nothing left in the tens. My tens column only goes up to the value of nine. If I want to instrument it or increase it by one, I've got to put something in the next column. I've got to put it into the hundreds. So it becomes one hundred, no tens, no units, drips in a hundred. Well, binary is very similar to that. Binary is what we tend to store digital signals in. However, in binary, we limit ourselves to just the number one or a zero. Now, there's a very good reason for that. Basically, it's because uh, digital works by voltages being high or low. Let's just skip all the way back here. Um, here's my digital signal. So you can see that I've either got a low voltage or a high voltage. And that's really easy to do, because what you should remember now from things like op amps and diodes is we can start to build up some pretty simple circuits, some relays even. Um, and it's based around the transistor, which you haven't met. Um, but you can either turn a circuit on or a circuit can be off. That's its basic principle. So with digital signals, I can have a low signal for a zero or a high signal for a one. And I should probably mention, actually, um, that's how we do the regeneration. We either have our signal being too low to register, so it's a zero, or high enough that it does register. And one of the principles is that we just say, um, we work out what our noise is likely to be, um, and then we make sure that we're shouting loud enough so our ones have a high enough value that it'll always give me a one even with some noise added. And that my zero is always going to be low enough that it's always zero even if I have noise on to it. Um, so I've got these ones and zeros. I can either have a zero or a one, high or low. So how does that work when I try and do some numbers? Well, one looks exactly the same. I have a one in my ones column. But if I now want to put the number two in, I've only got the digit zero or one, so I can't put anything in my ones column. So I have to go to the next column over. So two becomes one zero. Don't have anything left in the first column, so let's go into the second column. Three, just like in our system, becomes one one. Now if I want to record four, I can't put anything in the ones column because that's full. I've only got one digit in there. I can't put anything in my twos column because that's full. So I have to go into the next column. So it becomes one, zero, zero. And you should now start to see the pattern developing. Five becomes one, zero, one. Six becomes one, one, zero. Seven becomes one, one, one. Eight becomes one, zero, zero, zero. Um, and so what happens is I can have an eighths column, a fours column, a twos column, and a ones column. It's exactly the same as our number system, but instead of having hundreds, tens, and units, I have eights, fours, and twos. Now, on your course, you only have to go up to a four-bit number. That four-bit number. That means that you're going to have eights, fours, twos, and ones. You could go up to any number of bits you like. The biggest bit, so the, the leftmost bit, 
That is called the most significant bit, or MSB. It means the biggest number. The leftmost one is the least significant bit. So you might sometimes see that referenced on your course. Um, now, why does all of this matter? Well, there is one big disadvantage of digital signaling, and that is, I'm going to try and explain that to you now. So in digital to analog conversion, we take our analog signal and we run it through an analog to digital converter. So we're doing our sampling. Remember, sampling means taking the value of my wave at different points. Now what that does is it records a set of values at specific times. Now straight away you should be able to see here that I've got a problem. I'm throwing away lots of data in this process. Um, firstly, I have to round to the nearest sampleable thing. So if I can only measure, say, 0 0.1 volts, I have to round to the nearest 0 0.1 volts. And secondly, uh, I only sample at certain in time intervals. So I go sample, 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 sample. And whenever I hit that value, um, whenever, sorry, whenever there's a tick, um, I have to take a sample. So you can see how it's become all blocky and nasty looking. Um, I haven't got the original beautiful sound quality that I had. Now there are lots of uh, filters that we can do and sort of circuits that we can build that will try and smooth it out, but the smoothed out version is never going to be identical to the uh, original version. And that's one of the reasons why people, there's been a real resurgence in uh, vinyl records at the moment. People are saying that this digitally processed signal doesn't sound as good as the analog because the computer's guessing. We're, when we do our sampling, we're throwing away chunks of data. Now, I personally have a vinyl record player, and I love it, but I'm going to show you that I'm an idiot for thinking that, um, because there are some mathematics that we need to deal with. Um, so there are two things that are likely to come up on your course. The first is sampling rate. So the sampling rate is the number of samples that you take every second, and there's the bit rate, and the bit rate is the precision of the digital number used to store the information. Um, and by making, making both of those as high as possible, you get the highest uh, quality and the highest reproduction of the original. Um, and that's linked to this thing called Nyquist's theorem. And Nyquist's theorem says that in order to accurately reproduce a signal, the maximum sampling rate should be twice the maximum frequency in your original signal. So to explain that, I'm going to use the example of a CD. Um, in CD audio, because it's a digital technique, as very digital, digitally sampled, the sampling rate is 44.1 kilohertz. Now that should kind of make sense to you because the highest frequency humans can hear is 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz. So if I double it, I get about 40,000 kilohertz and for technical reasons, 44.1 um, kilohertz was chosen as the maximum sample rate for a CD. The, the bit rate is 16 bits, so I use 16 digital bits. Now, 16 to the power 2, sorry, that says 216 on my slide, but it should be 2 to the power 16, gives you 65,536 possible values. So when I record a CD, what I'm doing um, is taking the voltage of a microphone 44.1 thousand times per second, and I'm recording that voltage with a precision to uh, well, whatever my maximum minimum of uh, voltage of my microphone is, divided by uh, 65,536. So you can see that CD audio sampling is actually really, really, uh, generates huge amounts of data, and it gives you very good quality sound. That's why we use it for music. If I was doing just voice, uh, the human voice only scrapped up to about 4 kilohertz, so I could use a much lower sampling rate because I don't need to go up to about 8 kilohertz as my sampling rate. Um, and I also, to get such a faithful reproduction, as long as you can understand me, I can really reduce the bit rate too. Um, so one of the things that we often have to do in digital communication is decide uh, whether we want really, really faithful reproduction of the original analog signal, or whether we want to reduce the file size and reduce the amount of bits that we need to send. Generally, the higher the number of the bits, the slower you can, it's going to transmit, um, and the more bandwidth and the more internet you're going to need, or, or whatever uh, system you use to send your signal. Just one little aside, this isn't actually part of your course, but I think it's interesting. This is why Nyquist's theorem matters. This is a process called aliasing. Um, and what you can see here, the red line is my true signal, and I've put dots in every time I've sampled it. Now what you can see is those dots, they line up along the blue line. So I'm actually going to record a different signal to the one that was truly there. And that's why Nyquist's theorem is important. I have to sample at least twice 
for every complete wave. And that way I will eliminate this possibility of getting the aliasing um, where I reconstruct a signal that's very different to my original. Okay, um, we went through that pretty quickly, um, but I hope that this is fairly simple to you. If you do have a look in your textbook, there's loads of extra examples in there. Um, this is one of the few chapters that is actually pretty well explained in the textbook. Um, so do have a look through that. If you have any questions, as always, Please come and see me, otherwise I will see you in our lesson. Thanks for watching.